All right. Um, here we are again. And uh, just want to welcome all of you here today, those on Zoom and live stream. So glad you can, you know, be with us. And uh, it's a good opportunity to study the Bible. Um, we're still uh, going through 1 John. And today we're in 1 John 4, 7 through 18. And the title is Love or Fear. You know, the natural product of being a true child of God is that we no longer live in the spirit of fear but of sonship. Romans 8, 15 says, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. False prophets are still living in the spirit of fear. That's why they have so many problems. But we will cover that in a minute. Let's start by reading verse 7. Uh, through verse 10 verse 11 beloved let us love one another for love is from god and everyone who lo loves is born of god and knows god the one who does not love does not know god for god is love by this the love of god was manifest in us that god has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to, the be, to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. You know, when I was teaching on the Trinity, I was pointing out that, you know, God is love for sure. Why? Because he's three persons in one. And they all loved each other before the beginning of time. As we discovered in a former lesson in 1 John, true believers are known for their love of God and love for one another. Love is from God because God is love. Therefore, the one who claims to love God will love his brother. If he doesn't, he proves he doesn't know God. The world doesn't know God, thus they don't really know love. Galatians 4, 8 says, Formerly when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. Those who do not know God are serving other gods. Either they're serving themselves or the enemy or both. God loves us so much that he sent his only son to be rejected by men and die a humiliating, lonely death on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. How much more love can one have than that? Here's a story of how one true believer followed in the footsteps of Jesus Christ to reach people with the gospel. The Moravians were banished from their homeland, Bohemia, and exiled to various countries in 1620. Some came to Germany and found refuge on the on the on the estate of Nicola, uh, Count Nicholas uh, Ludwig von Zinzendorf. That's that's seventeen hundred to seventeen fifty six. It was here on his estate that they became known as the Moravian Brethren, the forerunners of the Protestant missionary movement. In seventeen thirty, Count Zinzendorf told the Moravians about the urgent need for missionaries to evangelize the slaves on the Virgin Islands. Leonard Dober listened to Zinzendorf's appeal. As he pondered God's calling, Dober felt excited about his op this opportunity to serve. But he also envisioned the severe persecution he would endure by selling himself into slavery to evangelize these people. He anticipated the horrible working conditions, but above all, the degradation of slavery. No price was too, too high, he thought, when Jesus Christ endured persecution and died for him. So Leonard Dober, at the age of 18, became the first Moravian missionary to the Virgin Island 
sugar plantation slaves. However, the source of his persecution didn't come from the slave master's whip, but from fellow Christians. Dober found himself ridiculed, mocked, and chastened for his decision to go to the Virgin Islands. The Christians asked him incredulous questions about how he planned to live in the Virgin Islands and how he intended to minister to the slaves. The persecution climaxed when Christians discovered that Dober planned to sell himself into slavery. As Dober um, endured this opposition, he thought that if he had proposed to travel as an ambassador of state, he would have been treated differently. But since he was a servant of Jesus Christ commissioned to preach the gospel, he was looked upon as a fool. Dober arrived in the Virgin Islands in the late 1730s, but he didn't have to become a pl plantation slave. Instead, he became a servant in the governor's house. But soon he resigned his position as he was concerned that this position was so superior to that of the slaves that it was detrimental to reaching them for Christ. He chose instead to live in a small mud hut where he could work one-on-one -on -one with the slaves. In three years, his ministry grew to include 13,000 new converts. Wow. Even though Leonard Dober did not have to pay the supreme sacrifice of his life to evangelize the Virgin Island slaves, it's important to note that he was ready to accept persecution and even martyrdom for these people. Through the pioneering efforts of the Moravians, millions have followed in their footsteps, reaching nations around the world with the message of the gospel. Many of you probably know that I, my parents and I both became members of the Liebenzell mission, a German mission, the same mission that Norman Dietsch uh, was a part of. And uh, we're very thankful to people like Hudson Taylor, who were uh, who really inspired the mission efforts to the Micronesian islands in particular? On the first John four twelve, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. You know that's an important verse for us today. Many false prophets claim to have seen God in order to try to give themselves credibility. But the Bible says that no one has seen God at any time. But you might ask, didn't Moses see God? Haven't people seen visions of Jesus Christ? Well, the answer is that no one has ever seen the face of God the Father. Men have seen Jesus Christ in the flesh, obviously. And Stephen and Paul saw him at the, right, at the Father's right hand. John saw a vision, of, a vision of Jesus where he was so awestruck that he fell down as if he were dead. That's Revelation 117. But no man can see the Father in the flesh and live. To Moses, God said in Exodus 33, 20, you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. Someday when we're changed to be like him, though, we will see him face to face. What an amazing thing. 1 Corinthians 13, 12, now, we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Wow, I look forward to that. But John's point is that though we cannot now look at God's face in this life, we have him living in us. If we love one another, his love abides in us, not only abides, but is perfected. That means that we grow in love daily as we walk in the Spirit. First Thessalonians 3.12, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. Second John 1.6, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you've heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. You know, our love is not perfect. 
But the only way to grow toward perfection is to love one another in obedience to the commands of God. The next verse, verse 13, says this, By this we know we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. You know, we have the assurance of salvation and a relationship of sonship with God the Father through Jesus Christ, the Son, because he has given us his spirit. His indwelling spirit testifies to our relationship with God. Romans 8.16 The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Hebrews 10, 15 through 18. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my law, my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And, and where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. So never allow false teachers to tell you that you're saved, but you don't have the Holy Spirit. Claiming they can transfer the Holy Spirit to you by some ritual like laying on of hands. You know, that's a devilish false doctrine. Refer them to this, this verse and the verses above. Tell them that you are saved and have the indwelling spirit. And that, and that spirit testifies to the fact that you are a child of God. That's the only way it can happen. On to first verse 14. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. You know, that's the gospel message that we bring. We testify that the Father has sent his Son to be our Savior. If someone confesses that Jesus Christ is God, God abides in him. But remember, the people can say this, but not really mean it. They will say it, but then say something else. Like Jesus is a manifestation of God, or Jesus was not fully God at any point, or that Jesus was not fully man, but spirit only, or some other such teaching. That's why you need to be careful that what they claim they believe is in line with what they're actually teaching and doing. If they deny that Jesus Christ, God, came in the flesh in some way, they're not in God. If they add to the definition of who Jesus Christ is by making him into some kind of pantheistic being, you know, he's like he's, like, he's part of the trees, rocks, animals, and everything else in the universe, like the indigenous people's movement does, then if they state that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, they're actually misrepresenting Christ. If they say that Jesus Christ was the brother of Lucifer, like the Mormons and, and Kenneth Copeland, they're misrepresenting Christ. If they say that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, but he was only a great prophet, like the Muslims or Baha'i, they're not in God. If they say that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, but that you are not indwelled with the Spirit till they transfer the Holy Spirit to you, like Benny Hinn and almost every other false teacher on TV, they're not in God. If they say that Jesus Christ had to be born again in hell to be the firstborn, a, mis a misrepresentation of Scripture, like Benny Hinn and most other Word of Faith teachers, that is redefining who God is, and they are not in God. That's what John's saying. Be careful to investigate what people claim to believe beyond their doctrinal statements, which in many cases, unfortunately, are actually there in order to deceive true believers. Verse 16, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because he is, so also are we in this world. In verse 16, John 
repeats what he has been saying in the preceding verses. We know we have come to believe in Jesus Christ because the Holy Spirit of love abides in us. As we abide in God and his love, he abides in us. If we do not abide in his love, he does not abide in us. How does a person not abide in the love of God? Well, the Bible's specific about that. It's by disobedience to his commands and the teachings of the word of God. 1 John 3.24, the one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. We know this, that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. We can have confidence in our salvation on the day of judgment because as children of God, we are his representatives in this world because he abides in us. He lives in us. This is not to say that we're all little gods or gods in this world, whatever. That's false teaching that people like Stephen Furtick and others teach using this verse and a few others. That's not what John is saying. He says we are light and salt in the world and represent his love. Matthew 5, 13 through 16, you are the salt of the world. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men. Then they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Hey, that's a big part of our witness, folks. Notice that we're not the ones in heaven. That would be God. We are his earthly representatives. And there is only one God. Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I myself am he. There is no God besides me. I put to death and I bring to life. I have wounded and I will heal. And no one can deliver out of my hand. Ephesians 44, 6, this is what the Lord says, Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty, I am first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Therefore, all other quote-unquote gods are false gods. They're idols, not gods at all. There's a whole bunch of references. Let me read them off really quick. And you can go back and pick them up and look look these up. Deuteronomy 32, 21. 1 Samuel 12, 21. Psalm 96, 5. Isaiah 37, 19. And 41, 23 through 24. And also 29. Jeremiah 2, 11. Jeremiah 5, 7. Jeremiah 16, 20. And 1 Corinthians 8, 4. And 10, 19 through 20. Finally, we come to the crux of this section. We either have the love of God, which abides in us as we abide in him, or we have a spirit of fear. 1 John 4, 18, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because love involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. Before you and I were believers, we lived in fear of many things, including judgment. We might not have known it entirely, but when we came to understand the gospel by the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we understood why we were living in fear. God gives every man a conscience, and somehow, if deeply buried, we all sense that we're under judgment and not pleasing God in some way at some time during our lives. This doesn't contradict the Bible, which states we're completely sinful and without hope, but it's to say that non-believers live in fear and their consciences somehow try to tell them that. This is also true for people who call themselves believers, but demonstrate that they still live in fear. You know, I discussed this in my New Apostolic Reformation DVD series where I quoted some of their false prophets as saying that Christians live in fear. 
Unbelievable. An interesting theme that was repeated in the National School of the Prophets videos in the op and in the open memorandum addressing the Twin Towers War by C. Peter Wagner is that they claim that God has given the church and Christians a spirit of fear. Chuck Pierce said this. Now, what's the first thing God said this year that he wanted to do so that we could begin to come to into an anointing and a mentality for increase. He said, I'm going to take this year and I'm going to deal with the fears of my people. The spirit of God said to me, I'm going to deal with the spirit of fear in my people because this is a year that I want them to advance into increase. Now turn to your neighbor and say, get ready to advance into increase. <laughs> you know what? If you're fearing, you don't have the Lord. He also said this, the spirit of fear is opposite from the gift and the power of love. Therefore, uh, let's, while we are here, renounce the power of fear that is operating in us so we can go forth in love so God's kingdom can advance. <laughs> so the spirit of fear is operating in you? That means you're not saved, man. See, Peter Wagner quotes Barbara Yoder as saying this, the purpose of the Twin Towers attacks was to release massive fear. Well, that may be true from the enemy, but we as Christians were not to fear. Though that was one of the stated goals of the Muslim terrorists, these new apostles meant something further. Joseph Askins is quoted as saying that we should pray this, that we would not let a spirit of fear come among us in the in New York and across the nation. You know, we should indeed pray that our nation not be given over to fear, but then C. Peter Wagner goes on to say this. Unfortunately, a number of Christian leaders have been opening the doors for a spirit of fear in the body of Christ over the past few years. Oh, brother. Wagner then quotes a prophecy by Rick Joyner, Another evidence of cross-pollination between the camps and says this, several major words are weighing on us. The primary one that I have been hearing is walking in the power of the age to come. Uh-oh. I don't think we should be doing that. Wagner concludes the section by saying the church needs to move from fear to power. Though a spirit of fear may grip the world, it should not grip us as believers. Our confidence is in the creator and sustainer of this universe, who carries us and rescues us by sending his only son to die for us. I've told you this before. One of my favorite verses is Isaiah 46, 4. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. The false teaching of Wagner, Pierce, and others in the New Apostolic Reformation is that God has given believers a spirit of fear. The Bible clearly states that God is not giving us a spirit of fear, but of sonship. And I already read that from Romans 8, 15. So the saying, no fear actually most accurately applies to faithful followers of Christ because we know fully who our father is and we trust him. Those whose trust is misplaced will experience fear. Those who trust in themselves or our government will be afraid. Those who trust in the Lord need not be afraid. We can then say this with the psalmist, Psalms 56, 4, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? Isaiah also proclaims, Isaiah 12, 2, Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. The other troubling aspect to Rick Joyner's proposed solution, which C. Peter Wagner agrees with, it is that we need to walk in the power of the age to come. 
Wagner believes that we are on the threshold of entering a season in which the power of God in prophecy, healing, miracles, strategic level, spiritual warfare, and prophetic intercession will be widely manifested through common believers on a regular basis. The problem with this scenario is that the Bible clearly states that the end times will be a time of lying wonders and false prophets. 2 Thessalonians 2 9, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. Mark 13 22, for false Christ and false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect, if that were possible. So Wagner is clearly not talking about the millennial age of Christ to come, but some kind of age before that. He forgets that the Antichrist comes first. The power of the age we live in, leading to the Antichrist, is the power of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. It's the Antichrist spirit. Ephesians 2, 1 through 2, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. Boy, that's what we're seeing now, aren't we? Those who are disobedient to, command, to the commands of the Lord and thus don't really love the Lord, John 14, 24 and 15, 10, are those who seek after the power of the age to come and not the sonship of the one to come. Those who live for signs and wonders in this age will come to know the fear that the spirit of this present world works in those who are disobedient. 1 Corinthians 2.12 We have not received the spirit of fear of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. Those who are true believers know their father. Those who claim to be true believers but live in disobedience continue in the sins of heresy and false prophecy and the lack of fruit of the Spirit. And they do not understand that God has freely given to those who truly believe in him a spirit of sonship. And therefore, we will not fear terrorism. We will not fear man. We will not fear war. We will not fear persecution. And we will not fear death. Thank you.